As I begin the sermon today, the message today, I'd like you to meditate on the words from Acts chapter 2. The reading earlier in a few verses that follow. And the words of the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. This is what Peter says at the end of his sermon on Pentecost. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Have you ever become so familiar with a story that you know exactly what's going to happen, how it's going to end from the moment you hear the first line, the, the first note from the score of the movie, or, or from a story, and you see that first page. You know exactly what's coming. Maybe it, it's a favorite childhood story that you read again and again, or that your parents read to you, or that, that you read to your child as a parent. Maybe it, it's one of those stories that you just know has become so ingrained. Stories like the three little pigs. You know from the beginning that as soon as that, that first scene starts, that in the end, the big bad wolf is going to huff and puff, and he's going to blow, but that brick house is going to stand. And then he is going to sulk off hungry 
and disappointed. Or maybe it's one of those Christmas classics, like how the Grinch stole Christmas. And from the very first moment you hear those lines, Yahoo, Dore, Yahoo, Dore, you know exactly how the story is going to end. That the Grinch, that his heart that day is going to grow three sizes. And that he's going to find the strength of ten Grinches. He's going to pull that sleigh back from the brink. And he's going to ride back down with the gifts and the roast beast into the feast. And he's going to sit next to Cindy Lou Who and save Christmas for Whoville. That all things are going to turn out right. Or maybe it's one of your favorite movies. And from the, the moment the first scene starts... You know it all. You, you see those credits start to roll, the story for Star Wars, and, and you know exactly how the next scene is going to play out. You know every line. You, you know, especially when you hear the Imperial March, who's walking onto the scene. It's, it's Darth Vader, of course. But the same thing can happen in our day-to-day -day lives. See, we get so familiar with the stories that happen around us, the true stories, that we just assume we know the ending that we know what's going on, and so we just become numb to them. So we hear of another shooting, another terrorism attack, another act of senseless violence, and we shrug our shoulders. It's just the way the world is, broken. Or we hear of turmoil in the Middle East, and, well, that's been going on for decades. That's nothing new. Or we hear of, of politicians who don't want to work across the aisle, who don't want to talk to each other, who care more about their agenda and what they're trying to do in preserving their place than serving the people they've been elected by. From both sides, that happens. And we just roll our eyes. Politics as usual. Or on the positive side, the same thing can happen. You hear of a child being born. And unless it's in your immediate family, it doesn't impact your day-to-day -day life. You, you don't even pay much attention to it. Barely even notice. We've become numb to all of the stories, all the things happening around us. They don't impact our day-to-day -day lives anymore. The truth is, if you've been in the church for a long time, and you've been listening to the gospel story again and again, you hear these same stories every year, all of a sudden, the good news starts to sound like old news, tired news, pointless news. The same thing, the same message. I, I know Jesus rose from the dead. We, we did that every Easter. We, we've done that last Easter. We, we know he's ascended. We, we know Pentecost comes. We celebrate these same days year in and year out. I, I've heard of Jesus' miracles, his promises, his words of wisdom. But those miracles aren't happening in my day-to-day -day life. Those promises don't change what you're going through right now. Those words of wisdom are nice, but who has time for that when you're in the trenches of daily life? We get so caught up, so burned out because we've heard the same story that all of a sudden the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ doesn't impact us anymore. It's old news, tired news, good news for someone else, maybe. It's just became, it's become old hat. And so all of a sudden, the crucifixion doesn't surprise us. That the Son of God, who came down from heaven to be near us, that we rejected him and killed him and hung him on a cross, doesn't surprise us anymore. His bloody, wounded body, the scandal of the cross, no longer shocks us. We're numb. Peter on Pentecost, in today's lesson, preach this sermon, this hard-hitting sermon that can break through the blasé monotony of your day-to-day -day life and hit you like a ton of bricks. This is how he ends it. God has made, be sure of this, God has made him Lord and Christ, that is Lord and King, this Jesus whom you crucified. The you Peter uses here is not the Texas plural, all y'all. It's the person, he looks out the crowd of 3,000 plus and says, you killed Jesus. He looks out at you in the pew and says, you nailed him to the cross. He looks at me and says, I killed Jesus. Whew. It's hard.
hard to hear. And you might be thinking, but pastor, we weren't there. We weren't there to put the nails in his arms. Pastor, likely, it's likely that most of that crowd of 3,000 wasn't there outside of, of Pilate's court chanting, crucify him, crucify him. How can you say our voices were the ones crying out, scoffing with the mockers? Wasn't it the Jews and, and these lawless men who put Jesus to death? Well, technically, yes. But if you think that Jesus was powerless and weak, helpless at their mercy, then you need to rethink what you believe about Jesus. See, he wasn't there simply because he was powerless. He was there because of what we had done and for us, to give us deliverance. See, as it said in how deep the Father's love for us, it wasn't, he wasn't held there because of, of sinless, jealous, or sinful, jealous religious leaders, because of power-hungry Roman soldiers. It was my sin, my sin, your sin, that held him to the cross until it was finished, until it was complete. We put him there. See how great the searing pain of loss as the father turns his face away. The father turned his face away from his son in that moment of blinding pain and torment so that his face could be eternally turned toward you and me. God abandoned his son for that moment, allowed him to be buried in the grave, tortured and killed. But God did not forsake Jesus. See, he rose from the grave because the, the chains of death could not hold him. He is Lord over life and death. And so that, that could not hold him back in righteousness and glory and innocence. He rose from the grave. See, the resurrection, the Father raising Jesus from the dead in the power of the Holy Spirit is the vindication of everything Jesus said and did in his life. So the messages he proclaimed were true. God has declared that they are true by the resurrection. That Jesus really is the only way, truth, and life. That no one can come to the Father except through him. That's a scandalous, exclusive claim. But Jesus said that that's true about him. And the only way we can truly come to know the Father, and we can co truly come to know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is by seeing this plan from eternity coming to fulfillment by knowing Jesus bloodied and broken the crucified one but also the victorious and risen one by knowing the whole story by seeing that truth again that's how we come to know God more fully and know his love more fully this is what the church has proclaimed from day one and it's what you and I as God's children claimed and baptized continue to proclaim today that Jesus died because of our rebellion, because of our sin, because of our mistakes and faults and failures, but that God saw them and he had a plan from eternity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to come and redeem us. See, God saw us, but he wasn't content to abandon us. Instead, he came down in the form of a lowly servant and took our place. What great and wonderful good news that is. See, it's important that we hear this whole message, that we're reminded of this story. And as we hear this message of what God has done, what he's gone through, his, how deep his love truly is for us, we can't help as we hear messages like those of Peter's to come to our knees and say, what then must we do to be saved? How do we make this message a message for my life, not just some generic good news, not just tired old news, but message for me today, where I am, message, a message for you, wherever you find yourself right now, how does this message become the message that transforms your life and shapes who you are? The answer is simple. We just need to listen to Peter's first four words of his response. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Breathe a sigh of relief. Go ahead. Shout a hallelujah. hallelujah. All right. Baptism has claimed you. If you have gone into these waters, 
You are claimed. You are washed. You are forgiven. You are given eternal life. You are a new creation. You are seen and clothed in Christ's righteousness. That's how God now sees you and looks at you. He sees you in love with the love of his most precious, dearest child. That is how God now looks at you. See, when we come to the waters of baptism, the norm is to have a child in, in a white robe. Because it symbolizes that through the waters, we are being clothed in the pure, righteous holiness of Christ. And that is now how God sees that child. But if that child, or you, or anyone else is like me, what happened after I left those waters? Did I stay pure and holy? You can ask my wife, the answer is no. The answer is I have made mistakes, I have continued to sin and fall short. So that's why we baptize children. The norm, anyways, is to baptize them in the midst of the congregation, in the fellowship of brothers and sisters, to bring them in as our brother and sister, and to have sponsors that come up and promise to help raise that child in the faith. See, there's this old saying that it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a congregation, a church, to raise a child in the faith. And when we bring a child before the congregation and baptize them, we are promising as the family of God to continue to remind that child of those promises. To remind one another as God's people of those promises given to us in baptism. To draw us back to those waters, to remind one another of the truth. And what is the truth? Jesus is the way, truth, and life. The gospel, the good news of what he has done for us. That's the truth, that there is forgiveness and life. See, we're to remind each other the truth and to call each other to repentance. Now, repentance, in case you aren't sure, literally means to stop walking in the direction you're going and to turn and walk in the opposite direction. So if you've sinned and started walking away from God, to repent is not just to feel sorry or ashamed. It's to turn around and start to actively seek to walk back in the light of God's promises and who God is. It's a call to follow our Father, to cling to that truth that was declared over us in baptism. To let that shape and define us. See, that's the truth, is that we're called to repent on a daily basis and return to those promises of baptism which do not fail. You see, when, when God's promises, when we walk away from them, the promise still holds. We've just stopped clinging to it. We've turned to our own ways. Baptism still saves us. Baptism is still what we need to remember. A and that baptism once was enough. I want to close by sharing an analogy. And this is paraphrased from what Luther has written in, in the book of Concord. I want you to imagine that baptism gets you a place, a seat, a cabin on the ship that takes you from this life to the next, to the, to the new creation, to heaven. When you're baptized, your spot on that ship is guaranteed. It is given. You have a ticket that no one can take from you. It can't be sold. It can't be given to anyone else. That promise, that ticket is for you. But when you sin, what you've done is you've jumped off the ship. You've abandoned the promise and gone into the waters. The ship isn't sunk. The promise doesn't fail. The ship is still afloat. You've just gone away from it. If you've jumped off the ship into, let's say, shark-infested, dangerous waters with no sight of land in sight, or no, no land in sight, I didn't say that very well, and the ship is still fine right behind you, what's the smart thing to do? Turn back and swim to the ship. Repent. That's the same thing. When we sin and we turn away from God and we start going our own way, God's promise still holds. Turn back to that promise. Turn back to that promise that says that you are a new creation, that you are forgiven. Baptism gives us forgiveness of sins. It gives us eternal life. Return again and again to that promise, which guarantees your life. See, we don't boast in, in our works, in our intelligence, in what we have, in our physical ability. All those things can be stripped away from us. Rather, we boast in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His blood shed for us. We cling to that truth because we know that his wounds have paid our ransom. And so we cling to the truth of what the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the triune God, their plan of salvation for us, their promise of forgiveness, love, and mercy that transforms our hearts and minds. Amen.